were a wealthy California family living the perfect life. They were well-connected, very successful, wonderful people. Until it was all shattered by unimaginable violence. People slain in their own home on Easter Sunday. That was a shock. This case was like a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle. The investigation would take detectives on a three-year manhunt ranging from the farms of Fresno to international drug cartels to catch a killer driven by greed. Some referred to it as Fresno County's crime of the century. You just couldn't imagine the level of evilness. April 21st, 1992. Around 9 a.m., police in Fresno, California receive a panicked call from the housekeeper of a local millionaire, 59-year-old businessman Dale Ewell. Housekeeper Juanita Avita arrived at her usual time. She came into the house and she immediately noticed that a door that leads to the kitchen was closed, which was highly unusual. She went in and at that point saw Tiffany laying face down in a puddle of blood. She then ran over to the neighbor's house and the police were called. Tiffany Ewell is Dale's 24-year-old daughter. When officers arrive, they immediately see she's been dead for some time. When we first went inside, you could see as you walked into the kitchen, uh, the body of Tiffany, uh, she was laying down with her head kind of pointed towards the southeast next to the dining room table. We surmised that she had been shot in the back of the head, just from where the blood was. But when police search the rest of the house, they discover Tiffany is not the only victim. There's a hallway that goes to the east from the dining room. And as we walked that way, it went into like a den or a study area. You can see the body of Glee. And as we walked that direction, you could see that the body of Dale was laying in another hallway just outside the den. He had a bunch of newspapers in his hand underneath him and around him. They discovered it was not one death, but three. Tiffany, her 57-year-old mother Glee, and her father Dale have all been shot. But why would anyone murder a family like the Yules? The family was a very prominent family in Fresno County. They were well-connected, very successful, wonderful people, and by all uh, counts, a happy family. Dale was a retired Air Force pilot from Ohio, and Glee was a former teacher. They'd gotten married in 1961 and moved to California to start a new life together. Dale was involved in uh, airplane business and you know, made a good living through that as well as through farming. His wife, Glee, was known for being involved in the community as a, as a volunteer in different ways. In 1967, Glee gave birth to their first child, Tiffany. Their son, Dana, came four years later in 1971. By then, Dale had become so successful that he invested in agricultural real estate. He soon amassed an $8 million fortune. Glee quit teaching to devote her time to philanthropy. Glee was a community activist, just a wonderful person who did a great deal of volunteer work within the community. Glee was a force of nature in a very nice way. She was a, an appointee to the State Bar Board of Governors. She also became the executive director of the Fresno Regional Foundation. Everybody seemed to, in most circles, know either Dale or Glee. They were very successful in what they did. But you'd never know the Yules were millionaires by looking at them. Fresno is a great community. We are based in agriculture. Everyone in the community is either a farmer, works for a farmer, 
or had family that was a farmer. The Yules had more wealth than most people in Fresno, and, and being able to fly airplanes and, and drive Mercedes and that sort of thing. But, you know, aside from those kinds of trappings, I, I wouldn't call them a, a flashy family. The Yules did not flaunt their wealth at all. For the amount of money that they were worth, they were very, very conservative. They made sure their children were given the opportunity to succeed as well. By 1992, Tiffany was a grad student at Fresno State, while Dana was studying business at Santa Clara University. Lee's children, I gathered, were a bit different. Tiffany, their daughter, was far more quiet, reserved, but wonderful in her way. And Glee would speak glowingly about her. She was just a very nice young lady who was reserved, did not have a ton of friends that she would socialize with. She was more family-oriented, but everybody who knew her seemed to like her. Dana was clearly the apple of Lee's eye. She spoke with great passion about his outgoing personality, his intellectual capabilities, his business acumen. Dana stood out as a intense, well-groomed, corporate type of young man. Dale and Dana had a fairly good father-son relationship. They were by all uh, counts a happy family. But now, three members of the Ewell family have been brutally murdered, and Fresno police are determined to find out why. It was a what we call a triple, and the fact that this was an affluent family in a decent part of town, and not your typical victims. So the whole unit responded out to this particular scene. Coming up, if someone is targeting the Ewell family, could Dana be next? We didn't know if Dana Ewell was still alive. We didn't know if he had not been massacred somewhere between their house and wherever he was. We just didn't know. Millionaire Dale Yule, his wife Glee, and their daughter Tiffany have been murdered in their Fresno, California home. And as investigators search the crime scene, the evidence begins to paint a disturbing picture. A homicide scene tells a story, and this one told a pretty clear story. The way the bodies were all spread out, it kind of gave us an idea on how the crime had gone down. It was clear that Tiffany was killed first, that she did not know what was coming. She was just standing in the kitchen and got shot in the back of the head. She was probably dead before she hit the floor. We believe that Glee saw this happen and actually saw the killer. Glee then ran from Tiffany's killer, ran into a den that she was shot multiple times. As she laid on the ground on her side, the killer stood above her and she actually looked up at him and was trying to basically, I guess, say no. And he shot her again while standing above her. She had her keys in her hand and in death had a look of fright on her face. After shooting the two women, it appears the killer then ambushed Dale. As he's walking down the hallway, the killer comes out from a bedroom and shoots him once in the head. And I think he was dead before he hit the ground also. The blood has dried, which tells police the attack occurred some time ago. But was it the result of a robbery gone wrong or something else? There was a box of 9mm shells in the nightstand in the master bedroom. And apparently Dale had a gun that went with that, a 9mm handgun, that was missing. The home had been ransacked quite a bit, and so the initial thought was that this could be a burglary. But upon closer inspection, there were a lot of inconsistencies with a burglary. We scoured the house, every entryway, every nook and cranny that anybody could get through that house. No signs of forced entry, the way the drawers were opened and then closed. 
burglars didn't do that. You leave them open so you don't touch them twice. It was, we felt, to make it look like a burglary had occurred and that Glee and Tiffany and Dale had interrupted a burglar. In fact, the evidence seems to suggest that whoever did this was a professional. Normally, we would expect to find just hair strands, fingerprints, a point of entry. It was incredible how little forensics was able to find in a four-day inspection. We really didn't find much of anything except the expended rounds. The precision of the shots, especially to Tiffany and Dale, one shot to the head, this is a hit. But why would a killer target Dale and his family on Easter weekend? When investigators talked to neighbors, they learned the Yules spent the holiday weekend at their beach house in nearby Pajaro Dunes. Their son Dana had returned from college to go with them. We didn't know there was a family member missing until we did some interviews with some people who knew the family. We're concerned that maybe he's to be another victim. At the time of the murders, Dana was a student at Santa Clara University. Law enforcement had to follow up to make sure that he was safe. Thankfully, they find Dana safe at school. He flies back to Fresno to speak with investigators. Dana had said he was trying to reach the family and couldn't. He did not react in a way that one would expect. He didn't shed tears over it. He didn't show any emotion. And you know, part of that could have been shock. Do you know of any reason why anybody would want your family to and he said that he didn't know of anyone who would want his family dead other than saying that his father was involved with some pretty high level individuals and he didn't know if any of those people could have wanted his family dead dana tells investigators he last saw his family two days ago at easter dinner he brought his girlfriend and her family to meet them He's dating at the time the daughter of an FBI agent in San Jose. So he invited them to dinner there at the uh, beach house. So there's Dana and Monica, his girlfriend, and then her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Zent. It was apparently a great dinner, and then when they all left, Dana went back with the Zents to their home. Dale flew home, and Glee and Tiffany drove home. Dale didn't like all of them flying together or all of them driving together because he was worried that if something were to happen, he didn't want the whole family to die together. He wanted somebody to be alive. Ironically, that meant Dale would arrive too late to save his wife and daughter. By the time he gets home, his family members have already been killed. But detectives find the timing rather curious. Tiffany and Glee had gotten home first. When they got into the dining room, the killer was waiting in the family room just around the corner. Approximately 30 minutes later, Dale ended up coming home through the garage. Why would a person who just committed two murders wait 30 to 40 minutes for somebody else to come home? That was very strange. Coming up, investigators discovered that the Yules had some powerful enemies. These people were targeted to die, period. That gets you back to the question, who benefits by this hit? Three members of the Yule family have been murdered during the Easter holidays. Police believe the gunman had access to the house, but the sole survivor, the Yule's son Dana, has an airtight alibi. At the time of the murders, he's with the FBI agent's family, hours away from the Yule home. They checked out everything he had said, and he had been with Monica over in the Santa Clara area. The autopsy report provides investigators with a few more cryptic clues. The pathologist recovered the bullets from the bodies, and the bullets looked like something that law enforcement, at least in Fresno, had never seen before. Some of the expended rounds that we had found in Glee had some really unique striation marks. The detectives put quite a bit of work into figuring out what could possibly have made those striations. 
the bullets turned out to be a match for the ones found on the nightstand in Dale and Glee's bedroom. We believe that the killer knew that those rounds were there, went, used those rounds to load up his gun, and committed the murders, and then stole the 9mm also. There are also traces of a strange substance. One of the other things we found were microscopic little bitty pieces of yellow fuzz, if you will. Little pieces of yellow material on Glee's clothing. We didn't know what that was. The evidence only raises more questions. But by now, the triple homicide has made the news. And Fresno police feel the pressure to come up with answers. It was a case that, frankly, fascinated me. I, I watched it in the news, I reviewed all the media, and, and wondered where this case was going to end up. We had to find a motive. So they started to look into backgrounds of Dale, Glee, and Tiffany to see what they could find out. Talking to family members, talking to friends, talking to whoever, find out what they were into. Dan spoke highly of Tiffany and said that she was a harmless creature and that he couldn't think of anyone who would possibly want to hurt Tiffany. She was daddy's little girl. She was very protected by her parents. She had apparently been in an accident when she was younger and received some trauma to her brain. And from everything we could find, she didn't have a, a mean bone in her body. There was no reason why she needed to be killed. During the course of the investigation, authorities discover that Glee hadn't always been an unassuming teacher. Earlier in her life, she had worked for the CIA. I went, wow, well, that's a big deal. So that was something they, they looked into, and it turned out not to be a, a covert type of position in the CIA. It was something a little less glamorous. In recent years, she'd become an outspoken civic activist. Was it possible she'd made enemies of the wrong people? Glee was in a position of power serving on a high-level state bar committee and was involved in decision-making that could have led someone to become very upset with her. People do crazy things, and you know we didn't know if maybe someone who wanted to be a judge got passed over and just got fed up with it. We had to eliminate those people as possible suspects. As investigators dig further, they find out Dale was in business with some dangerous people as well. He took over a business from a guy who went to prison. The person who owned Western Piper apparently had gotten some problems with running drugs with planes, and Dale swooped in and bought the company out from under him. The detectives were wondering at the time, is he mad that he lost this business the way he did? Were the Ewells executed on the orders of a drug runner? There was a lot of territorial gang violence where gangs were, were fighting over where the lines were drawn for their territory. We had the Bloods, we had the Crips, we have NF from the Western Familia. We had an influx of uh, Asian gangs when the Mongs came into the Central Valley and a lot of them settled in the Fresno area. But one of our biggest problems was the Bulldog Gang. They've been a thorn in the side of law enforcement for a long time in this area. They were kind of independent from everybody else and there's different sects, they really have no hierarchy, they fight each other. They've been a problem in the Fresno County area for a long time. Gang murders were pretty much at an all-time high. I believe the murders that year were over 100. Detectives learned that Dale's plane was stolen the day after the murders. They immediately put out an alert, hoping it might connect them to the cartels. But instead, the lead takes them somewhere unexpected. Dale apparently had a plane uh, at Western Piper who belonged to an attorney out of Las Vegas. And apparently the plane had needed some work done the attorney had actually gone and got his plane. He went and jumped in and got his plane out of there. The timing was really bad on the attorney's part. <laughs> That's something that, that they talked to him about. He was interviewed, and that was put to rest. Fresno police have hit a dead end at every turn so far. But have they been asking the right questions? All the possible motives it really comes back to who's going to benefit from this. Coming up, one name keeps coming back to the top of their list. He studied billionaires, he wrote to billionaires, he asked for jobs with people who were billionaires.
Detectives investigating the Yule family murders have been unable to come up with any solid leads. But they soon realized that they looked past one suspect a little too early. Who stands to gain the amount of money that these people are worth? And that came back to Dana. As the sole surviving family member, Dana stands to inherit Dale and Glee's entire $8 million estate. But is he capable of murder? Dana's personality was completely the opposite of anybody in his immediate family. I would describe him as eccentric. When he was in high school, he would wear suits and carry a briefcase. He would flash money. He would buy girls that he liked, expensive bottles of perfume. Everybody in the school was aware of Dana Yule and his love for money. He kept a, a collection of uh, billionaires. You know, most kids his age are collecting baseball and football cards. And here he is, his idea of, you know, collecting uh, memorabilia was about people who had become billionaires and millionaires. He studied billionaires. He wrote to billionaires. We even had some of the copies of letters. We refer to it as the billionaire collection. He was clearly aiming for a position of prominence in the world and wanted to be regarded as a, a wealthy businessman. Investigators have already confirmed Dana was nowhere near his family's home the day of the murders. But his behavior begins to raise suspicion, starting with the funerals. He was very cheap about buying coffins for his family members and the way he reacted at the funeral by treating it more like a social event than the way that you would expect any normal human being to act. He was working the room. He commented on a, on a lady's diamond ring. He was not acting like the grieving son. As detectives, that's where your spidey senses start to come in. Not only did he do that, but he didn't want to cooperate with us anymore. He actually got an attorney, and he wanted us to go through his attorney to talk to him, and which was really bizarre for a, a sole survivor of a family. You know, your family's been murdered. You don't want to work with the, the uh, law enforcement agency that's trying to solve the case. He acts even more strangely at the reading of the will. Dana found out for the first time that his father had set up the trust so that he would not get any money until he was 35, which was more than a decade away. He jumped up and he slammed his hand on the table and he said, why did my father do this to me? And that shocked everyone. Dale's brothers, they said, this isn't right, and they brought their concerns to Detective Souza and Detective Burke at that time. Greed is a powerful motive and police know that Dana didn't have to pull the trigger himself to be involved. There are the allegations that young Dana Yule wants to inherit seven or eight million dollars from his parents. He's willing to hire a gunman to kill his mother, his father, his sister on Easter Sunday. There was a lot of investigation to do up in Santa Clara regarding Dana and just finding out about him and what he was all about. Classmates tell detectives they should speak with Dana's best friend, Joel Radovich. It was a weird friendship because Joel was diametrically different than Dana. Dana, this uh, arrogant thousand dollar suit, rich boy, and Joel, the scrubby, sleeps wherever he can find a place, rides a skateboard, new wave hippie type. His whole contention that he wasn't really close with Dana and, you know, saw him a little bit, but, you know, they weren't really that as tight as people on campus and made them out to be. Joel confirms everything Dana told them, but detectives soon discover that both young men are lying. Now we've got two people that people say are really close and they're both saying, no, they're not really close. And one of the detectives happened to see Joel driving down the freeway and he followed him and he was actually staying at Dana's house. The hallway still had blood and gray matter from Dale's brain on the sides of the walls. So on a daily basis, Dana and Joel are walking past the blood and gray matter from Dana's father as if it's no big deal. When we started to key on Dana and Joel as having something to do with the homicides, is when we decided to start setting up the surveillances. For someone unemployed, Joel seems to be living very well. 
Dana paid for Joel's helicopter flight lessons in Fresno and didn't even hide it. We were able to show that Dana withdrew $125,000 in cash, that Joel spent about $75,000 in cash. But Joel hasn't spent all of the money on flight lessons. He's also bought several books that investigators find incriminating. Books that we were able to discover that Joel obtained was a book called Hitman. It was how you do your job as a professional hitman. It was generally pretty well written, but it had horrible pieces of advice in it. One was, if you are questioned by police, ask, are you going to arrest me? That's exactly what Joel did. The manual also contains instructions on how to build a silencer. That coupled with taking the flying lessons, I think he wanted to be an international hitman. You know, I, I don't know. I don't think he had any other uh, goal in life. Coming up, investigators believe they found their gunman. Now they just have to prove it. We have to put together a really strong case because neither of these individuals had any history of violence. After a year of investigation, Fresno police are tracking two suspects in the brutal murders of the Ewell family. Dale Inglee's wealth-obsessed son, Dana, and his best friend, Joel, who's been studying to be a hitman. At this point, gone back to school in Santa Clara, and Joel has moved to L.A. The way they would get a hold of each other was to page each other. Think back to the early 90s, so, you know, we're talking about people still using pay phones, people still using pagers. To keep tabs on the pair, detectives obtain a warrant to clone Joel's pager. Every time Joel would get a page from Dana, we would get the same page. There were a couple pay phones located at a location not too far from where he lived, and he would go to that location. They were able to basically have all of these different vehicles following Joel and communicating over the radio as to who would take over next. And if you were an expert in surveillance and you were being followed by this group, you would never have known it. When they started talking, we could send a detective up with a tape recorder and a backpack and go to the other phone and just act like he was having a conversation and hope to get Joel's side of the conversation. The recordings seemed to confirm police suspicions. He referred to the three-shirt deal, meaning the three family members, and that he needed money and he needed to get out of town. He actually said, I want my money and I want it now, because things were stretching out so long. Dana was extremely careful on where he would go, what payphones he would go to, unlike Joel. So it was a little more difficult to get Dana's side of the conversation. So on May 13th, 1993, investigators paid Dana a visit to try and rattle him. So they decided to go to Santa Clara University and knock on Dana's dorm door. And Chris Curtis looked at him and said, we know who killed your family. It was Joel Radosic. Dana then immediately shut the door in Detective Curtis's face. As soon as we told Dana that we think Joel killed his parents, Dana leaves campus and page Joel. And that's when things really started to ramp up. The surveillance team follows Joel to a restaurant in Ontario, California, where they observe him talking to a bartender named Jack Ponce. Detectives want to know why. Jack Ponce was about the same age as Joel. He and Joel had been friends since they were children. We need to go and talk to Jack Ponce. Interviewing him was like pulling teeth. Ponce denies any knowledge of the murders, but after several visits, investigators eventually get him to open up. You mentioned that the degree, let's go back to that. The degree was yours, the 22 was yours. Actually, uh, not the 22. I remember asking him early on if he had a 9mm, and he said no, he didn't. I think it was the fifth interview, finally. He goes, I, yeah, I, bought, I bought a 9mm. 
I go, what kind of 9mm did you have? Oh, it's an 18.9. It's a really nasty looking gun. He said he had bought it to shoot uh, squirrels in the attic, which was quite a, quite a gun to shoot squirrels with. Ponce conveniently claims that the gun had been stolen. Hoping to prove it was the murder weapon, investigators compare several 18.9 barrels with the bullet markings from the crime scene. It just turns out that this particular gun had a very unique twist in the barrel. The criminalist then recreated the exact silencer that the book described, got an 18.9, and then fired numerous rounds through that silencer. And that silencer is made with PVC pipe, and you stack it with tennis balls and steel wool. The striation mark came out. They were almost identical to the striation marks on the bullets that were recovered in Glee's body. The test also explains the fuzzy material found on Glee's clothing. The fuzz was pieces of tennis ball, the little yellow tennis balls. Ponce is immediately arrested. It doesn't take him long to turn on Joel Radovich. He basically spilled it that he had bought the gun and for Joel. Ponce says Joel told him exactly how he committed the murders while they were getting rid of the gun. Joel made the decision to uh, tell Jack what happened, not because he was confessing, but because you're in this too, buddy, and you need to keep your mouth shut. Joel said, you know, I shaved all the hair off my body except for my eyelashes and my eyebrows so I wouldn't leave any trace, and I was sitting on a plastic sheet waiting for the three to come home. There were so many different facts that Jack Ponce knew that he couldn't have known on his own, through the media, or from anybody but Joel Radovich. That level of planning that then went into the murders was just something that Fresno hadn't experienced. Ponce even agrees to show investigators where to find the murder weapon. Joel gave a bag of gun parts, the murder weapon plus the 9 mm that was stolen from the scene, to Jack Ponce to get rid of. Jack said he had thrown the parts at a variety of places down in, in San Fernando Valley, and the barrel of the murder weapon, he said, he buried it in a vacant lot in Reseda. Three years after the murders, who knows at that point if an apartment building or a house has been built on that lot. He's handcuffed and shackled. He looks down, he goes, right about here. Two shovels full, we hit something. Started digging around, it was the barrel. You get that piece of information that you know, that aha moment when you go, this son of a bitch did it. Coming up, investigators are close to making arrests, but will the rich kid get away with murder? People will look on the outside and say, well, this will be an easy trial. It was not an easy trial. Bartender Jack Ponce has confessed to participating in a plot to kill millionaire Dale Ewell and his family. And according to Ponce, 21-year-old Dana Ewell was the one pulling the strings. He was really a turning point in that case, explaining how Dana devised the plan, how he recruited Joel, and how the whole case unfolded. There was an estate worth seven or eight million dollars that he reasoned he would collect if there were no other heirs in front of him. It takes detectives some time to gather all the evidence, but on March 2nd, 1995, the two remaining conspirators are finally arrested. It took three years before investigators could arrest Dana and Joel. Part of that is Dana's alibi, uh, backed up by an FBI agent. We had to continue the investigation for much longer than would normally be done if the individuals were the types that had a significant criminal history. It would be difficult for a jury to find beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed such heinous murders. It was three counts of murder with three special circumstances, so it was a death penalty case. A string of motions and appeals tie up the case for several more years. Prosecutors use the time 
to build a stronger case. This case was like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. There were 162 witnesses who testified in this trial. It was building block upon building block. They laid out a very clear timeline of how Dana organized it with his friend Joel. He provided himself an alibi by going and seeing his girlfriend and having dinner with her family and her father was an FBI agent. In 1997, Dana Yule and Joel Radovich stand trial. Prosecutors come armed with a money trail they use to argue that Dana paid to have his family killed. We were able to show that Joel was given $125,000 in cash by Dana for no apparent reason other than tying him to the murders. Joel wants to be a hitman. Then you look at Dana and he hires everybody to do his dirty work. You know, throwing the money out there. Their star witness, Jack Ponce, provides the jury with all the details of the plot. But the defense argues that Ponce is an unreliable witness who is only implicating Dana in exchange for immunity. Anytime a witness is given immunity, the, their credibility is going to be suspect. Dana's attorneys took the tack that you can't believe a word that, that Ponce says. His testimony was something I thought should have been inadmissible, but it was, well, Joel Radovich told me that Danny Ewell told him, and uh, so you had what, what's called double hearsay. So the prosecution had to offer an exception, double exception to the hearsay rule there in order to introduce that. While Dana may be guilty of choosing the wrong friends, the defense insists there is no actual evidence linking him to the crimes. They had what you would call guilt by association. The relationship between my client and Joel Radovich. Uh, so they had, you know, them living together after the murders at the Ewell residence for a while, the paying for helicopter flying lessons, guilt by association evidence. After an eight month trial, the jury finally renders a verdict. It may have been one of the longest deliberations in a criminal case in Fresno County history. We returned guilty on all counts and also guilty on all enhancements and allegations. Some people cried, some people laughed. A whole range of emotions because it was such a long case. However, there's one thing the jury can't agree on. In California, it has to be a unanimous death verdict. This wasn't, so that left them with the only thing of life without parole, which is mandatory on a death case if the jury can't decide on death. I was extremely glad that I didn't have to sign that verdict as the foreman sentencing them to death. I was very relieved. Now, I had voted the death penalty, but I was glad I didn't have to sign that paper with my name. To investigators, it's a fitting sentence. In his greed, Dana Ewell had been willing to do anything to become a billionaire. Instead, he destroyed his family and lost everything, including his freedom. To see a family massacred and then ultimately by a child strips away a bit of the veneer of our comfort of our society. I really believe that Dana had a short circuit or a disconnect. He was arrogant. He thought he was the smartest person in the room. To this day, I have no sympathy for him whatsoever. This guy's a perfect psychopath. I have always thought, at least for Dana, that the worst day of his life was not the day that he was arrested. The worst day of his life was not the day he was convicted. The worst day was the day his last appeal expired. And now he knows every day for the rest of his life, his home is prison. He 
was a real estate tycoon with expensive tastes. He wanted people to know that he had money, that he was successful. He's the kind of person that when he came in the room, you knew he had come in the room. Until his mile-high ambitions came crashing down to earth. For someone to be literally blown up in a high-profile, high-end Tucson resort was very attention-grabbing. The investigation would delve into the exclusive world of Tucson's rich and famous to catch an assassin out to make a killing. The story is the epitome of American greed. Friday, November 1st, 1996. It's a little after 5 p.m., and Tucson's leisure class is kicking off the weekend with a round of golf. The players are among the city's most rich and powerful, and the biggest name on the course is 52-year-old Gary Triano. Gary Triano was a very charismatic personality. He was sort of a larger-than-life uh, real estate mogul. Every Friday, he would be out on the, the course with uh, people he was trying to get to invest in his latest venture. But this time, Gary's wheeling and dealing ends with a bang. At the end of the golfing, he came back to his car, and when he got into his car, the bomb went off. The explosion is described as like a funnel cloud that can be seen for miles from this resort. The roof has been peeled off the car by the explosive force. The doors have been blown open. The windshield's gone. It looked like somebody had just crushed this, this Lincoln Continental like a matchbox. First responders quickly arrive. But 52-year-old father and businessman Gary Triano is pronounced dead at the scene. There was no chance that Gary was going to survive this explosion. He was right on top of it. How could somebody hate somebody so much to, to want to murder them in, in, in such a violent and public way? Gary Triano was a longtime resident of Tucson who'd grown up with dreams of making it big. He was a Tucson kid, went to the University of Arizona, was in business with his father, if I remember right, selling cars in the beginning. Gary was first married to Mary Cram, and they were a, a very, very powerful couple, I would say. They had two children. By the early 80s, Gary had closed enough deals to become Tucson's leading real estate developer. If you were someone who was involved in the financial business in Tucson, Gary Triano was somebody you would have known. Gary was very flamboyant. He was a high roller. When he had money, he would spend money. He would tip lavishly. He would go on long trips to Europe. But Gary also took care of those less fortunate. Gary was very philanthropic, and he believed in the Boys and Girls Club here. He was very, very good to this community. In 1986, Gary's reputation earned him the attention of another Tucson luminary, Pamela Phillips. But Pam was, you know, kind of up by the bootstraps gal from Tucson. She wanted to be one of the first females that was in commercial real estate in Tucson. And she achieved that. She made it all the way to the top. Gary hosted numerous parties, and friends tell me that uh, she would go to these parties, and that's how they met. She sort of crashed the party, zeroed in on Gary. They had a whirlwind romance. They get married right away. They have a very lavish wedding. It's a black tie affair on a yacht in San Diego. He left Mary to get married to Pamela Phillips. They were kind of a, a power couple. 
in Tucson. Donald Trump came here at one point with Marlo Maples and stayed with them for about a month. They became friends and later went down to Mar-a-Lago. They become part of that jet set where they're flying off to, you know, have lunch in Greece or uh, flying to his estate in Florida. But in the early 90s, Gary and Pam's jet-setting days came to a sudden end. He was, you know, tapped out. I mean, all those wonderful jet trips cost a lot of money. <laughs> she realizes that her marriage is not what she believed it to be when she's pregnant with her first child. But two kids into the marriage, she's now having to put up her own money to keep Gary afloat. Gary was forced out of one of the Indian gaming businesses at the time, and once he was forced out of that, as well as some of the real estate things that were going on, Gary lost money and ended up having to file for bankruptcy. Gary started getting into real trouble financially, and I think Pam got very scared for her and her children's safety because of that. And I think that's what finally triggered the divorce. I mean, they were not happy with each other. So she takes the kids and, and takes off to Aspen. He's gone through a bankruptcy. He is living in a spare bedroom of a friend of his. He's driving a borrowed car. He's more down and out than he's been for quite a while. In spite of these setbacks, Gary was determined to turn his life around. Gary was the type of guy that he would never give up. And even though he was down today, there was a real good chance that by next year, he'd be back on top. He wanted to convey the image and the message that he was making some kind of a comeback. But he would never get the chance. Someone had made sure Gary never climbed back to the top and Tucson police are determined to find out who. Everybody was in total disbelief. This is the kind of stuff that you read about, you see it on TV, but you don't think it's going to happen to you. This is not only a who did it case and a how done it case. What would drive somebody to do this? Coming up, Gary Triano was deeper in the hole than anyone realized. When reporters asked the sheriff if there are any suspects, Sheriff Dupnik said, open the phone book. Millionaire real estate developer Gary Triano has been killed by a car bomb outside of Tucson's exclusive La Paloma Country Club. Police arrive to find the area in complete chaos. It's really hectic because you've got bits and pieces of the car all over the parking lot. You've got golfers and employees wandering out now into the crime scene. It's pandemonium. Initially, what we do is we totally contain the scene. So in other words, we shut down the entire country club. What you see initially when you actually go to the blast scene is there's a Lincoln Town car sitting parked in a parking space. The roof has been peeled off the car by the explosive force. The doors have been blown open. The windshield was blown out of the car over the trees and landed in the swimming pool. There were parts of the car up on the roofs of the buildings nearby. To see a major, massively destructive blast like this, this was a first for me. I mean, this would be the world's biggest jigsaw puzzle with no picture of what the puzzle was. The crime scene is so complex, federal agents are brought in to assist the investigation. Over the next few days, they are able to reconstruct the bombing. It's not just the sheriff's department at that point, but they call in assistance from the Tucson Police Department bomb squad. ATF, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. The FBI comes in. The ATF guys, they took all the pieces of the material back to their lab in California, and they started telling us about how it was a pipe bomb. The bomb looked like it had been sort of like it was an amateur had done it. You know, it was a 17-inch pipe bomb, which was already a strange measurement for a pipe bomb. The device was actually overbuilt for its purpose. It was far more explosive power than was needed. Our 
belief was it was built off the instructions off the internet and probably wasn't built to the specifics of killing a sole occupant of a vehicle. The bomb itself, we were able to determine, was housed in a canvas bag, a mundane canvas bag, easily purchased. Through interviews, we knew that Gary very rarely locked his car, so it was not hard to believe that the killer just opened the car door, placed the bag with the bomb in it. What we didn't know is what detonated the device. Was it uh, motion activated? Was it on a timer? Or was it command detonated? Eventually, what ATF is able to determine is that it was remote controlled. The killer was probably within 100 yards laying in wait uh, with his remote detonator. Nat told us that the killer had to be in the parking lot. They had to watch Gary get into the car that night before they detonated the bomb. And the bomber set their trap for Gary during his birthday weekend. It was his birthday, and uh, there was a celebration for him that weekend. So he may very well have thought that this was somebody, a friend, that dropped off a a birthday present for him. The golf outing had been prearranged so that the family knew where he was going to be and when he would be coming back home. They were waiting, you know, all excited to surprise him. And instead, their surprise turned into a nightmare. Had to have been somebody who knew Gary, knew his habits. He had to sit there patiently waiting after he planted the device in the car. And then once he saw Mr. Triano get in the car, he pulls the trigger. It's pretty evil when you think about it. When investigators speak to Gary's family, they say he's made more than a few enemies over the years. What we found out pretty soon was that Gary had a lot of business dealings, but he currently was in a large amount of debt, over $26 million in debt. It was clear by the end of his life that he was spending a lot of money he didn't have. Gary had lots of friends in high places, and he was able to sort of, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul. He was always doing a sort of shell game where he was shuffling money around. Gary's ex-wife believes one of those enemies decided to get payback. When Pam and I met at the Sheriff's Department, she talked a lot about the Indian gaming and about threats as a result of the Indian gaming. She believes that Gary, you know, was involved in all kinds of nefarious dealings and that it had to have been organized crime somehow. She said he was on a hit list and she was scared. And I never saw her scared. We talked to numerous people who told us that Gary had mentioned to them that he felt like he was being followed. We never were able to get anything that we felt like we could uh, follow up on as far as identifying who that might be. If you owe money to the mob, they kill you publicly so other people get the message. Coming up, a shocking tip leads investigators across state lines. When you take all the information that was found, you can't ignore it. It's almost like this guy has got his shopping list to murder Gary Triano. Tucson police are investigating the murder of 52-year-old real estate mogul Gary Triano. And the evidence so far suggests his killer might be connected to the Mafia. Tucson is the place that a lot of reputed mobsters have retired in because they consider it safe. It's kind of off the beaten path a little bit. The Bonanno family retired there. The Castellanos retired there. The idea that it was a mob hit, it came from the fact that it was a car bombing. When you think of a car bomb, you think of sort of East Coast Mafia, mob kind of thing. With over $25 million in unpaid debts, the list of suspects seems endless. Gary had borrowed money from a lot of different people. There were investors in Mexico that some people thought were, you know, less than reputable. 
he had actually started negotiations with a group in China. Gary Triano not only owed four and a half million dollars to casinos in Las Vegas, he was threatening a lawsuit against a guy named Gary Fears in St. Louis. Gary had so many enemies that, you know, it was it would have been easier to find out who wanted to keep him alive than than want him dead. Detectives tracked down every possible lead, but despite his suspicious business dealings, they keep coming up empty handed. In the days and weeks after the bombing, detectives are interviewing every known associate of Gary Triano that they can find. You follow out the thread of organized crime. You follow out the thread of a person who was financially crippled by Mr. Triano's failed financial advice. And as you followed each of those out through the investigation, they all just went away. There was nothing in his life that when you took it and amassed it and put it together that led to a motive for murder. Then, just as the investigation seems to hit a dead end, the Pima County Sheriff's Office received some unexpected help. It was national news, and that first week after the bombing, I got a message to call a detective in Aspen, Colorado. And that's when I first met Detective Jim Crowley. Detective Crowley talked to me about a fraud investigation that he was involved in, that Ron Young was the principal suspect. He was a businessman who was really more of a confidence man. Investigators learned that seven months before Gary Triano's murder, Aspen authorities were preparing to bring in Ron Young on fraud charges. He disappeared before they got the chance. He was on the run. He was on the run because he, he had a warrant out for his arrest. Ron Young had rented a van using a fictitious credit card. And result of that, the van was reported stolen. The van stolen in Aspen had turned up in California one month before the murder. And it appears to contain new evidence investigators now realize is connected to Gary's murder. In October of 1996, in Brea, California, some neighbors report a van that's been parked on their street in a cul-de-sac for a few days. They call the local law enforcement. The cop sees it as a stolen vehicle, and they call the detective up in Aspen that had taken the stolen report and say, we got this van, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in it that we have no idea what this means. Jim Crowley, the detective from Aspen, searches the van, and in it, he finds a sawed-off shotgun. He finds notes that list close relations or friends of Gary Triano. He finds a map of Tucson. Detective Crowley says, hey, I saw the bombing on the news, and I think that that bombing is related to a fraud case that I've been working in Aspen. He knew that he had to get a hold of us and share his information with our investigation. When Tucson detectives inspect the van's contents, they find more clues connecting Ron to the bombing. We went back to all the contents of the van and really delved into them. And that's when we found friends and relatives, car descriptions, car license plates of friends and family close to Gary Triano. They've got receipts from a hotel here in Tucson that was in close proximity of where uh, the Triano house was. We went to the hotel and went through all their receipts from 1996 and we were able to show that Ron had stayed in this hotel here in Tucson for about a week prior to the murder. It's quite possible when Gary told his friend that he felt somebody was following him, it was Ronald Young. But why would a con man from Aspen murder a struggling Tucson real estate developer? It's all very suspicious, but where's the motive? At this point, Ron Young has just disappeared. He is nowhere to be found. He has gone off the maps. Coming up, investigators follow the money to find the missing pieces of the puzzle. In other words, who benefited financially from Gary's death?
Thanks to a call from the Aspen Police Department, investigators in Tucson have discovered that a con man named Ronald Young was targeting Gary Triano. The question is, why? As detectives in Arizona and Colorado compare notes, they realize the two men share a personal connection. Jim Crowley, a detective with the Aspen Police Department, he said, you know, I happen to have interest in Pam Phillips, who is Gary Triano's ex-wife. Before the bombing happens, Detective Crowley gets an interesting phone call from Pam Phillips about a year prior. Pam Phillips calls him up because Pam has realized that she's just been defrauded, bilked out of $300,000 by Ron. She called me and said, yeah, I just got taken and this guy just, you know, took all my money. But it seems Pam had quickly withdrawn the accusation. Crowley goes into depth that publicly she cried wolf, that Ron Young had done these horrible financial things to me but wouldn't go on record and wouldn't file a report with the Aspen Police Department. Meanwhile, Ron and her kind of make up, and she strangely calls Detective Cowley and says, you know what, it was my mistake, I made an accounting error, and I don't want to press charges anymore. I'd ask her about him, and she'd just turn her head and walk away. She never, ever said his name again. Pam's friends think they know why. According to them, the two had started out as business partners about a year after her divorce, but their relationship wasn't strictly professional. Initially, their relationship is sort of a teacher-pupil relationship. Ron is making himself useful in Pam's life. He's taking care of her business, and their relationship sort of morphs into more than a business arrangement. And it came out that she was romantically involved with Ronald Young in Aspen. Every once in a while, they'll have drinks too late, and Ron will wind up asleep on the couch, you know, sometimes then wanders into the bedroom. I think Pam used her uh, beauty and sex for men in that, that way. That was her tool. Investigators now know that Pam is the connection between Ron and Gary Triano. But had Ron been using her to get to her husband? Or was Pam in on the plot? It could be, certainly, that Ron Young had sort of looked into Pam Phillips's background, collected a lot of, of information about her and her ex-husband to try to perpetrate some further fraud on her. The big question that remained for Detective Gamber was... Did he work alone? Did Ron Young do this on his own? To test Pam, investigators asked her to come in for an interview. During the interview, I didn't want her to know how much I knew about Ron. So when I pretty much nonchalantly threw his name out, there was just a long pause. She's denying his relationship with her. She completely minimizes him and their relationship to the point of, you know, like, oh, uh, how did you hear about him? Outwardly, she appeared to cooperate with the investigation. It wasn't until we asked her if she would take a polygraph that she started some more pausing and some more, no, I don't know if I want to do that. Police find Pam's behavior suspicious but she and Gary were already divorced. So what motive would she have for killing him? We have to follow the money. And where it got interesting is when we started to look at Pam Phillips. We had pulled the divorce records and we knew that there were a lot of issues. The divorce wasn't smooth. There was was fight over over the children. There was allegations that Gary was hiding money. This is a time when Pam is running out of money. I mean, she tells the au pair at one point that she's down to her last $60,000. As investigators dig deeper, they discover that Pam still stood to gain a lot from Gary's death. The detectives are doing their due diligence. They do find out about the insurance policy that Pam Phillips had on Gary's life that she maintained even after the divorce. 
the insurance policy consisted of a $2 million life insurance. I was told, and then we were able to confirm through records, that the children were the beneficiaries. But the children are minors, and so Pam's the, the guardian, of course, so she's getting the money. Pam took that money and bought her first house with it in Aspen. I was invited over there to go house hunting with her. It's like, who had the most to benefit? And who had the motive? And Pam Phillips had the motive. But investigators know it's still not enough to make an arrest. So the really frustrating part about this case is that, you know, they have all of this evidence, but there's too many loose ends. Pam Phillips was definitely a potential suspect. However, one of the main people that we wanted to talk to was a fugitive, and he was nowhere to be found. By November of 1997, the case has come to a complete standstill. Detectives begin to wonder if it will ever be solved. We revisit the story on the one-year anniversary. Still no arrests. No one in custody, no person of interest, nothing, nada. The only really unknown at the end of the task force was we needed to talk to Ron Young. Coming up, the hunt for the missing con man finally ends. So after this long nine-year hiatus, they finally get the tip. Nearly a decade after the murder of Gary Triano, detectives are still focused on two suspects, Pamela Phillips and Ron Young. But they still don't have enough evidence to charge either of them, and Ron is still in hiding. Everybody worked this case down to the last possible lead, and then we were left, where's Ron Young? In November of 2005, investigators decide to make one last attempt to draw Ron out. I mean, there's this push that we need to do something on it. The sheriff's department really wants to, to solve this case. When the thought of America's Most Wanted came up, it seemed like a logical way to at least try to locate him. It really hit the national spotlight when it debuted. It just kind of let everybody know to be on the lookout for this man who is a person of interest, Ronald Young. The episode airs on November 19th. Within 24 hours, Tucson police get the tip they were hoping for. What happened was Ron Young's chiropractor in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, called in and said, Ron, this guy is a patient of mine, but he's a patient under a different name. Not only is he a client, but he's got an appointment that morning. So there is this scramble for the fugitive detail in Broward County to set up outside this chiropractor's office. Sure enough, Ron Young comes up in a taxi and is immediately apprehended. With Ron finally in custody, investigators swiftly execute a search warrant for his apartment and vehicle. There are boxes and boxes of, you know, all sorts of things, floppy disks, thumb drives, hard drives, paper receipts. There is just this treasure trove of information. As the recordings were analyzed, as the computer was analyzed, it was evident that they had a financial relationship. The evidence that's becoming clear is that Ron Young is owed $400,000 by Pam Phillips uh, for a job that he did for her. He's meticulously, like an accountant, kept track of every payment. Over the course of years, there are tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash that Pam Phillips is sending to Ron Young. That's obviously huge evidence. But it's the phone calls that Ron Young has been recording between the two of them that ultimately is the downfall for both of them. When investigators listen to the tapes, they immediately recognize the two voices. 
We took one of the micro cassettes, put it into a recorder and started to play it. And instantly you heard Ron Young's voice and he was talking to Pam Phillips. I can't really talk right now, but I put something in the mail. Thanks. Bye. In the minute I heard her voice, I knew that he was talking on the phone with Pam Phillips. And at that point, I just said, this, this has got to be the answer. Probably one of the most damning recordings was when there was an argument over the money, how much she was sending, how much she wasn't sending. I'm like cashless. I need to like restructure, reorganize, re um, do something. You know what? I just can't handle this. I really can't. It's too dangerous. She argues with him, says, I've, I've paid you enough. And Ron Young says, you know, you will pay me the rest of my money or you will be in prison for murder. And her response is, so will you. That's when I said, okay, we've got him. But when Aspen police try to arrest Pamela, they discover she's now on the run. After the indictment came down, they found that she had left for Europe. What we know is that she took a flight that took her through Atlanta, then on to Gatwick Airport in London, and then possibly on to Munich. And that's all we know. To track her down, detectives enlist the aid of Interpol. They start conducting a European investigation on her. And about one year later, I get a call, and it's basically Pam is in custody in Vienna, Austria. The way that they track her down in a very ironic, almost coincidental scenario is she stiffs her limousine driver. She didn't pay him one time, and the guy went to the police there. And that's how she got caught. She has again found herself a man, a rich man, to align with. And she's living the high life again. She has literally reinvented herself in Vienna, Austria. On July 2nd, 2010, Pam is finally taken into custody at the Tucson International Airport. What was reported to me is her comment was, if Gamber's in the airport, I'm not getting off the plane. Then she gets handed over to me. So it was, it was a good feeling. I kept asking her questions the whole time until she got into the detective's car. And I said, well, how does it feel to be back in Tucson? And she looked at me and she said, it's very hot. Well, it got a lot hotter. Coming up, Gary's accused killers finally stand trial. But will a jury convict them? I knew it was only the beginning. The investigation was gonna go under a microscope. Nearly 18 years after the murder of real estate tycoon Gary Triano, prosecutors in Tucson, Arizona have finally charged two co-conspirators with the crime. Gary's ex-wife, Pamela Phillips, and her ex-lover, Ron Young. The trials begin with Ron Young in February of 2010. The evidence is, you know, the recordings, all the evidence that he'd saved. He makes a trip to Tucson, and he stalks Gary, and he learns about his habits. Ron Young had established Gary's pattern of going to the La Paloma Country Club. He constructed the device. He planted it in the car. He sat back, and he waited for Gary Triano's golf game to end, and that's when he hit the detonate button. The public defender's office just said that the state's case was very circumstantial and didn't rise to the level of beyond a reasonable doubt. But the jury disagrees. Ron is found guilty. Ron never admitted to anything. He uh, professed his innocence throughout the trial. It was the jury that came back and decided that he was involved in this. Four years later, it's Pamela's turn to face a jury. Before she goes to trial, 
the judge deemed that she was incompetent to stand trial. So she goes through all these tests and she goes through all this rehabilitation to get her competent to stand trial. Basically, the prosecution theory of the case is that Ron Young was hired by Pam Phillips to kill Gary Triano. They wind up getting into an arrangement where Pam convinces Ron that she's got this $2 million life insurance policy and that if he carries out this hit on Gary, she'll pay him $400,000. According to the DA, the meticulous notes Ron kept are more than enough proof of Pam's involvement. She gets the money from the insurance claim early 1997, and she starts paying Ron Young these payments shortly thereafter. We're talking $400,000, and it's being paid out in in bits and pieces, you know, it was very suspicious. He was doing work for her, trying to help her start this business called Star Babies. And he wanted the money sent to him in a wire transactions that were kind of separated and hidden and looked bad. But that isn't the only evidence linking Pamela to the murder. On February 27th, prosecutors call a new witness to the stand. Pam has a best friend of hers, Laura Chapman, who is the prosecution's surprise witness. After Ron Young's trial and he's convicted, Laura Chapman comes forward. She says, you know, Pam told me before Gary was murdered that when they were having marital problems that Pam should just hire a hitman and take him out. That became sort of the, the smoking gun of Pam Phillips' trial. However, the defense argues that none of it proves Pam is guilty of murder. They could never really place her at the scene of the crime, you know, so they have to link her to Ron and they have to link her through emails and things that can be interpreted differently. In fact, Pam's attorneys have their own theory about who killed Gary. The whole defense was geared toward this dead billionaire in Tucson that had a beef with Gary Triano. The person we think was involved with this case was a, a guy named Neil McNeese. Neil McNeese had been threatening to kill Gary Triano for a number of years. We all know as trial lawyers that if you do a third party culpability, it's your story versus the state's theory of the case. It's not about reasonable doubt anymore. It's about whose theory the jury believes. As the jury deliberates, it's anyone's guess which story they will believe. You're always uh, nervous about whether or not you were able to come up with enough evidence that the jury would agree with your theory of the case. On April 8th, 2014, they return with their verdict. She's guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder and first degree murder. And her sentence is natural life in prison, which in Arizona means that's life without parole. It wasn't until we got the verdict that I breathed a sigh of relief. That was probably the, the most gratification that, that most homicide detectives get on a case. Gary's children were there, his ex-wife was there, his brother. And there was just this sense of relief. I mean, after almost two decades, they finally felt that they got some measure of justice. An insatiable desire for the finer things in life had driven Pam to gamble on the perfect murder. Instead, she'd lost everything. There was, I think, some sadness that, that you know, here we, Pam Phillips, you know, she didn't have to do this. She was not destitute by any, any means. Pam orchestrated this murder absolutely out of revenge, but also just plain and simple greed. She was told that she was going to live a lavish lifestyle, be part of the rich and famous, be this elite socialite. It just sort of epitomized the ugly side of American greed. You know, what would somebody do for money
He was a family man with a love for the outdoors. There's deer all the time, turkeys, raccoons. There's a lot of wildlife in our neighborhood. He especially liked the deer. He built a custom feeder, and that's where he kept the corn. Until his disgruntled neighbor decided to put an end to his hobby. I go home. There's dead flowing. And when it's one dead animal, it's easy to think it's a coincidence, but it didn't stop there. And when their feud ends in bloodshed, investigators must determine who's to blame. It wasn't something that was happening over the course of a couple months. These guys had been at it for years. It's the Hatfields versus the McCoys, and it was just one of those perfect storms. May 5th, 2014. It's a quiet Monday evening in the picturesque town of New Brighton, Minnesota. Sean Bortell and his wife are tucking their children into bed. But at 8.32 p.m., their domestic routine is shattered by the sounds of gunfire. It was boom, 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 boom. And I froze. And it's not uncommon to hear fireworks or things like that in the neighborhood. And my wife immediately said, those are gunshots, call the police. 911, where is your emergency? I think somebody just fired a gun near our house, like four shots. While the operator takes the Bortel's information, a much more urgent call comes in. 911, where is your emergency? Who's shooting us? What needs an ambulance? I'm shot, yes! On the phone is 48-year-old Jennifer Clevin. She says she and her boyfriend, 46-year-old Todd Stevens, were outside their house when a gunman opened fire. She ran inside, injured and bleeding, and she picked up the phone, called 911. Can you tell me if the man that did this is still there? He me shooting through my house. I'm scared to go near the window. Okay, Jennifer, we have a lot of help on the way, okay? We get here now. Her longtime partner had been shot. She didn't know if he was still alive. I can only imagine how frightened and upset she was. Police and paramedics quickly arrive to find Todd Stevens lying on the ground, unresponsive. They have to get in there and keep themselves safe, assess the situation, determine if there's an active shooter. Even if the shooting itself is over, who did it, where did it come from? Todd Stevens was a longtime resident of New Brighton. In fact, he was raised on the same block where he and Jennifer now lived. The neighborhood is pretty small. Everyone's very close. Um, there's older families, younger families with kids. Like, I have people who have lived there their whole lives. Todd and I had talked quite a bit about his history in the neighborhood. He grew up in the house that, that we had purchased. He had moved into the house that he had while his parents lived next door to him for some time. The couple had first met 18 years before in 1996. Jennifer was a single mom with a young son. She just moved from Texas to Minnesota, and Todd was a short-haul truck driver. They hit it off pretty quickly. Todd was good with Jennifer's son, Ryan, so when the relationship grew more serious, they moved in to Todd's house. They hadn't gotten married yet, but they weren't any less of a family. Jennifer described their life together as wonderful. Todd was an avid outdoorsman and often took Jennifer and Ryan camping, but they didn't have to go very far to enjoy the wilderness. New Brighton is a wooded area near several lakes and preserves. We have Rice Creek right across the street from my home. There's deer all the time, turkeys, raccoons. It's just, there's a lot of wildlife in our neighborhood and that's part of what makes the neighborhood great. Todd liked having all the animals around, but he especially liked the deer. He built a custom deer feeder where he kept it full of corn. I definitely saw more deer, partly because they used our yard to walk to, to, to get to the corn. My kids thought it was cool. In addition to his deer feeder, Todd was also well known for his outgoing personality. He was incredibly friendly. He loved his beer. 
actually seemed more friendly after having a number of beers, but not once had I seen Todd irate. According to most people, Todd and Jennifer appeared to be ordinary neighbors. Todd was incredibly helpful. Uh, one of my daughters had a flat tire. He helped out with that. We had a swing set. Todd came over and, and brought tools and helped out with that. So in general, it was a typically positive neighborly relationship. But now Todd is bleeding to death after being gunned down outside his home. When first responders got there, some helped Jennifer while others went to Todd to administer CPR. The whole time, they don't know if they have an active shooter situation and it is very tense. While officers try to secure the area, another call comes in. 911, where's your emergency? Someone's shot. What's your name? You'll find out. Coming up, Minnesota police find themselves in a standoff with the gunman. It's quite surprising for the shooter to call 911. In New Brighton, Minnesota, police and paramedics have descended upon the home of Todd Stevens and Jennifer Clevin, both victims of an unexplained shooting. My wife and I heard Jennifer scream. We were really afraid. We didn't know if there were people loose in the neighborhood. Who were these people? Who did the shooting? While first responders try to administer first aid, 911 operators are fielding another call about the attack. All right, do you so see the police shot are there. I'm not going to shoot the police or anything. I'm sorry, what? I said, I'm not going to shoot the police. The police are already here. They can go help the guy. Even though the caller won't tell them who he is, it's pretty clear through the context that they are talking to the gunman. So they try to keep him on the line and try to keep him talking. Who is the guy that's outside? Todd Stevens. Nobody listens to me around here. I told the guys that he's going to shoot us. He's got guns. Got guns, and uh, I, I, I've had. I just had enough. Okay. Are you planning on doing something to yourself? No. Are you willing to let the police come in? Not the New Brighton police. He wasn't going to surrender to the New Brighton police because he thought they were a bunch of, quote, coops. Neil said he already spoke to police earlier that day and told them about the threats that Todd made against him, but they ignored him. Todd was telling the neighbors that he was going to shoot you? He was going to shoot me, yeah. Can I ask what your name is? For Neil Zumberg. 57-year-old Neil Zumberg lives across the street from Todd and Jennifer, and he's currently holed up in his house with a gun. It wasn't just a random attack in a random neighborhood. There was one suspect with a gun who had a target. For the next half hour, you have a 911 dispatcher on the phone with him, and outside, you have a police commander trying to talk him down. By the end of it, you had law enforcement from multiple jurisdictions outside of his home ready for anything. Where is the gun that's in the house right now? I just want to make sure officers know so that it doesn't endanger you. Well, you don't care about me. I care. We don't want anything to happen to you. But you don't care about me. I know you don't. But just as officers are preparing to storm the house, there's a breakthrough. A dispatcher coordinates with the Ramsey County Sheriff's Department and somehow gets Neil to agree to give himself up then to sheriff's deputies instead of the local police. In the end, he just stepped out of his house with his hands up and went outside quietly. While Neil is taken in for questioning, investigators begin to process the crime scene. From Todd and Jennifer's wounds and the damage to the house, it looked like a shotgun was used in the attack. The house was struck several times by pellets. And they also entered uh, the residence and were lodged in the living room of the house. Uh, the front door, the screen door, uh, the glass was shattered. Outside the corner of the house, they found four spent shotgun shells. 
They mark all the shells and they have to take all their photographs. The shooter was 125 feet away um, across the street. A search of Neil's house turns up three possible weapons. Neil Zumberg had three long guns. Uh, those were from his father. One was a shotgun, one was a deer rifle. I think there might have been another shotgun as well. One of the shotguns, a Browning 12-gauge semi-automatic shotgun, was found in the Zumberg's basement on a chair. Neil's fingerprints were found on the gun and the shells were a match. But what caused the bad blood between these two neighbors in the first place? As investigators speak to the other local residents, they begin to get a clearer picture. It was just a normal day. I was outside um, in my backyard with my dogs. I knew right away that it was gunshots, and it was an odd sound for our neighborhood. So immediately I thought of Todd and Neil. It seemed like that's the direction where it was coming from. This was not the first time that these two families had gotten into it with each other. His wife, Paula, also locked horns with Todd's girlfriend, Jennifer, as well. In fact, Paula Zumberg had been spotted fleeing the area just after the shooting occurred. My wife had looked outside to see Paula near the edge of her lawn, looking across the street at Todd's house, going to her car and then driving away. It turned out that Paula and Jennifer were also overheard having a loud argument earlier that day, so police had to wonder if that also played a part. As the police investigation begins to unfold, they're sort of discovering that there's this feud that, that's playing into what had happened. It wasn't something that just happened over the course of a week. It wasn't something that was happening over the course of a couple months. These guys had been at it for years. What kind of feud could have led to this level of violence? From an outsider's perspective, it was hard to know who had said what, which threats had actually been made, who was actually afraid. Um, I think things had just gotten blown so out of proportion. Coming up, a double shooting becomes a murder investigation. Everyone was just very confused and shocked and surprised. Six-year-old Todd Stevens and his girlfriend Jennifer Clevin have both been shot by their neighbor. Unfortunately, Todd's wounds proved to be fatal. Todd had also been hit several times with a shotgun blast, so he had wounds to his head, to his chest, to his abdomen, and his extremities. He bled to death before they could do much for him. Jennifer is luckier. Thankfully, her injuries weren't as serious. She was hit twice with the buckshot. One of the pellets went through the right side of her abdomen and the other her left. While doctors tend to Jennifer's wounds, investigators ask her to help them figure out how the shooting occurred. She had a first row seat as a witness to what happened. She was a victim of the shooting and she was, you know, a part of this feud for all those years. But the first thing they had to do was break the bad news to Jennifer. It's hard to imagine to lose your boyfriend of 20 years, but then to also be an eyewitness to his murder. Is Todd dead? I'm sorry, he has passed away. This oh, hurt. No, no. No. Oh, no, no, no. Jennifer says they lived across the street from the Zumbergs for over 17 years. And at first, the two families got along well. Todd and Jennifer were in the neighborhood first. The Zumbergs bought their home, I believe, in 1998. Neil was a physical therapist, and his wife Paula also worked in healthcare. They had two boys and a girl. The Zumbergs would come to Todd Stevens' house and have cookouts and what have you. One of the Zumberg's sons, Jacob, even became best friends with Jennifer's son, Ryan. He was raised in my house with my son. I love Jake. Over the years, however, Jennifer says Neil became increasingly hostile towards them. 
over what seemed to be nothing more than a simple disagreement. Todd's deer feeder was directly in his front yard. So next, again, next to our house. And of course, in plain sight of Neil's yard. Mr. Zumberg did not like the victim and his girlfriend feeding the deer. He didn't uh, like that because the deer would come into the yards, pass through his property. Zumberg tried to argue that feeding the deer was illegal, but the truth was, he didn't like having them around. He just saw them as pests. It's not illegal to feed wildlife, especially deer. You're just using corn. But Neil decided he was going to put a stop to it anyway. According to Jennifer, around 2012, Neil Zumberg started a campaign of retaliation and of harassment to make them stop feeding the deer. When intimidation didn't work, Jennifer says Neil went after the source of the problem. My deer feeder can't listen. If they weren't going to listen to reason, Neil just figured he'd destroy the damn thing. But Todd wasn't the type of person to just let that go. Good old Todd, he got some PVC pipe and poured some concrete in the ground and put a new one in there. There were multiple deer feeders, I think, that were broken. I don't think it was just one incident. Then, as the skirmish continued, a mysterious letter was delivered. Everyone in the neighborhood got a letter in their mailbox the same day. It was a Xerox copy. When we moved in, we received a letter, and I believe the letter initially sent was anonymous, uh, although hand scrawled with a prescription for Neil on there. It's sort of referred to as the Mr. Corn letter because Mr. Zumberg referred to Todd as Mr. Corn because he would feed the deer with corn. The letter accused Todd of endangering the health and well being of the entire neighborhood. Deer can carry ticks that cause Lyme disease in humans. And in page two of the letter is a copy of the prescription that Neil's doctors gave him to treat it. Neil Zumberg felt that he got Lyme disease because of the deer coming through his yard, going to Todd Stevens' house to feed on the corn. He was very angry about it. This went way beyond a dispute between two households. I mean, to try and get all your neighbors involved, that's throwing fuel on a fire. But that wasn't enough for Neil Zumberg. He sent a copy of the letter to the local newspapers who ran it. Probably a human interest story as much as a potential health risk. I mean, it sounded a little bit crazy. I mean, quite honestly, it seems somewhat humorous because of just the nature of the dynamics. Of course, we had no idea that it would lead to something serious. Coming up, the neighborhood feud takes a darker turn. If they'll go so far as to drop a dead animal in your yard, what else will they do? Hours after a neighborhood shooting left Todd Stevens dead, Minnesota police have the gunman in custody. According to Todd's girlfriend, Jennifer, they were targeted by their neighbor across the street, Neil Zumberg, because he didn't like them feeding the wild deer. Jennifer tells police the feud had been brewing for almost 10 years. And in 2012, Neil took his campaign of harassment to a new and disturbing level. I go home. There's death And when it's one dead animal, it's easy to think it's a coincidence, but it didn't stop there. Soon, there were all kinds of dead animals showing up in the yard. Dead bird, a deer light. Two weeks later, another deer light. She apparently got fed up with it and decided to go to local law enforcement. Jennifer was afraid. She petitioned the court for an order for protection, and they granted it. However... A court order wouldn't prevent another incident from occurring in December of 2012. It was winter, and there were two dead deer in Todd's lawn. We were just walking out to take our girls to the bus stop, and traumatic sight for them to see. Todd was already outside, Jennifer was outside. They clearly were frustrated, understandably so. Can you imagine waking up and finding dead animals in your backyard? 
I mean, we have dogs, and sometimes we'll find little critters in the yard. Easily explainable. But random animals in your yard, that's, that's a whole different level. That's designed to scare you. Police got involved and tried to figure out maybe who placed them there. Todd certainly thought Neil did it. Neil denied that. So a lot of indirect anger was placed towards each other. Jennifer says when they confronted Neil, he threatened to kill them too. There was a sort of a, a gradual escalation of things. You know, it went from veiled threats that stemmed from frustration out of their feud uh, that went to threats of violence. You walk on and say, I'm going to kill you. After that, Todd and Jennifer decided to install security cameras outside their house. They were tired of the arguments and the police coming. They put cameras up and they faced those cameras to the Zumberg residence. Once the security cameras went up, there were no more dead animals found in the yard, so that's telling. But still, the threats continued. By the spring of 2014, tensions had reached an all-time high. And that led to another confrontation with Neil's son, Jake. There was a run-in at the Spring Lake Park VFW where Jennifer and Todd were playing bingo. And the Zumberg son, Jacob, was there and approached the couple. Jennifer said he'd been drinking and accused them of giving his father Lyme disease. He was so angry and so aggressive that management kicked him out. They said, I'm going to kill y'all and bring your house down. They were legitimately afraid and called police. Jacob was gone by the time they got there, but uh, cops said, call us if you see him again. And he was charged um, with making terroristic threats. So the police already had Neil Zumberg in custody, but it makes you think, did the son have something to do with it and his father was just covering it up? A week later, on May 5th, Jennifer ran into Jake again. She had gone to pick up food at a local takeout place, and as she was leaving, Jacob came in. Knowing that he had essentially gone off the grid for the last week and that the police wanted her to let them know, she called the cops. Jake was arrested at the restaurant, and when Jake's mom, Paula, got wind of it, she was really angry at Jennifer. That was the straw that broke the camel's back on this kind of a Hatfield to McCoy situation. When Jennifer got home, uh, about 8.30 p.m., Paula was right there and walked outside to confront her. Jennifer tried to defuse it, or at least open it up to an actual conversation. But according to Jennifer, Paula wasn't interested in talking. She's like, oh, I'll kill you myself. There's no telling how far that altercation might have gone if Todd did not step in. Jennifer said that when Todd came outside that he didn't say a word, he just came out silently and stood next to her. For a moment, it seemed the situation had been diffused. Then, the first shots rang out. Neil Zumberg suddenly came from around the corner of the house and started blasting them with the shotgun without any warning. When she saw Todd going down, and I think just sort of looked up and, and realized that Neil was over there with the gun, and then she scrambled inside to, to call 911. My bullets are going through my front door. Paul up and saying, shoot, 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 shoot. He was adding them on to shoot. It's a harrowing story, and one that seems to fit the evidence gathered so far. But when detectives speak to Neil Zumberg, the story he tells is very different from anything they've heard so far. Coming up, was it murder or an act of self-defense? He threatened to kill me, my wife, my kids. He said, I just had enough.
After surrendering to police, 57-year-old Neil Zumberg has been taken to the New Brighton Police Department for questioning in the murder of Todd Stevens. We'd like to talk to you about what happened tonight, kind of what spurred you on, what happened with the argument. You feel like you can tell us the story? I probably should. It's up to you. We'd like to hear from you because we don't know. There wasn't a whole lot of question that Neil had been the gunman. I mean, he called police. He surrendered. They just needed to secure the physical evidence to sort of corroborate his story. Neil agrees with only two things Jennifer told police. What started the feud and what caused it to escalate. This is all about deer, basically. New Brighton police won't do nothing. These people made our lives miserable and then they just... Didn't, didn't do anything about it. Like Jennifer, he says the relationship between their two families started out good. But when Todd built that deer feeder, Neil's life became a nightmare. There was one deer, and then it turned into five deer, and then 10 deer, and then freaking 20 deer, and then our whole lives turned into deer. And I just wanted them to stop feeding the deer. The Zemberg family would observe the deer coming through because their property abutted a railroad track, I believe, and some woods. So the deer would come out uh, from that area across the Zemberg backyard. Neil says he first tried putting up a fence to block the deer, but Todd retaliated. Todd got really pissed off because he cut the, the fence that, that's on, on the trail that goes along our, along our property okay. so the deer can get through there easier. A little while after that, Neil says that he contracted Lyme disease. And the only logical reason seemed to be all the wild deer. He tried to warn his neighbors with the letter, but the Jennifer started to falsely accuse him with ridiculous accusations like leaving deer parts on his lawn. It was his lies. They just wanted me to quit complaining about the deer. And the new right police says, we just want you to stop. Just stop. We don't care what's right or wrong. This one cop told me to stop it, you know. So they well, no, I'm not going to stop it. I got Lyme disease. Neil says his illness, as well as the court order Todd and Jennifer had placed against him, affected his ability to work. And things only got worse. Todd liked to work out in his garage, so he always had, like, um, a bench press bar and would kind of blare the music and be, like, lifting weights in the driveway. And it was always super loud and kind of, like, way hyper-masculine. He also said that Todd was loud at parties at his house and shooting his guns. I wanted to be a good neighbor. We just moved in, and he was all boom, boom, shooting his 30-30 up in the air. So it just went on and on. I mean, with, with, uh, with them getting drunk and... and, and just making our lives miserable. Officers had been called before, sometimes for the dispute between the neighbors, uh, and sometimes to respond to domestic events over at Todd and Jennifer's house. Police records appear to support Neil's claims. And Neil says that after he filed his complaints, Todd turned his violent aggression toward him. He would get pissed off just because I complained about the deer. Mm -hmm. We'd make threats, and they always instigate the According to Neil, his son Jake didn't start the confrontation at the park. Todd did. It was Todd that was trying to pick a fight with them. He's done the same thing with my son Nick, threatened him, threatened to kill me. Neil says it all came to a head the night of the shooting, after his son Nick called to tell them Jennifer had Jake arrested. She went out, uh, I saw him pull up, and she goes, I'm going to go give them a piece of my mind. My wife went out. I said, no, just stay in the house. Next thing you know, they're swearing back and forth, and, and I came out. He apparently grabbed the shotgun in case things got out of hand because he knew that Todd and Jennifer had guns at the house. Neil said that he actually got that gun prepped a week before the actual shooting, loaded it. Uh, showed his wife how to use it and stuck it under a couch in the living room in fear that things would escalate. So he comes from around the side of the house trying to keep out of sight. According to Neil, he's not planning on doing anything. He's just there just in case. 
and I was watching, uh, making sure that they weren't going to shoot my wife or something. And, and uh, this happened, man. Neil claimed that he saw Todd saying something threatening toward Paula, something to the effect of, I'm going to kill her, fill in the blanks with some expletives. And all he carries a gun and stuff, and they're screaming and yelling, and all he had is our own like this, and then he kind of went down like this, and, and I just, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he was armed. That's when Neil opened fire. His wife was in danger, so he just pulled the trigger, and with all the adrenaline going, he just kept on shooting until it was over. What made today different? I don't know, just everything. All that put together? Fear, my wife's crying, she can't sleep at night. Fear of getting shot. Neil didn't come across as a cold-blooded killer in the interview. Near the end, he even asked how Todd and Jennifer were doing. They hadn't told him yet. Hopefully, he's all right. I got the feeling he's not. Um, how about her? Huh? She's never been an uh, intended target of anything. But whether or not Neil intended to kill anyone, the fact remained that Todd was dead. The day after his surrender, Neil is charged with second-degree murder and attempted murder. As for Neil's wife, Paula, police tracked her down at her mother's house. But when they brought her in for questioning, she lawyered up. She wasn't saying anything. Prosecutors try to reach a plea agreement, but Neil refuses. So on May 8th, Paula Zumberg is also charged with aiding and abetting her husband's crimes. Coming up, two warring families face off in court. This wasn't self-defense or a crime of passion. He planned to kill Todd Stevens. Like I said, it's the Hatfields versus the McCoys. Neil and Paula Zumberg have both been charged in the murder of their neighbor, Todd Stevens. Prosecutors believe the shooting was motivated by a long-standing feud between the two families. While Neil Zumber pulled the trigger, his wife Paula is charged with aiding and abetting the murder. The allegation was that she was urging her husband to shoot. Paula goes on trial first in August of 2014, three months after Todd's death. Instead of trying her case in front of a jury, Paula's attorney pushed for a bench trial, which means the case would solely be decided by the judge. It was a strategic move. Mrs. Zumberg would not do well in front of a jury. She's a very caustic individual. She's prickly. The jury would not accept her very well. Todd's girlfriend, Jennifer Clevin, is the prosecution's star witness. She told the same story she told police, but unfortunately, the testimony didn't play as well with the judge. She initially claimed that Paula was egging him on. That was not corroborated by anybody else. Neighbors had opened their windows or got out on their stoop to listen, and they never heard Mrs. Umberg say, shoot, shoot the gun, shoot him. Paula's attorney did not even have to call witnesses. He argued that the state did not prove its case against Paula, and the judge ultimately agreed. Paula Zumberg is acquitted. A year later, in August 2015, Neil's trial gets underway. His charges have been upgraded to first-degree murder. The first-degree premeditated murder is the highest level charge in Minnesota, and it carries an automatic life without parole sentence. The state says Neil's actions in the week before the shooting did prove that this was not a case of self-defense or a crime of passion. He planned to kill Todd Stevens. He had his gun ready, loaded under the couch. It had previously been in his basement, unloaded. He exited the window, took up a sniper position, and fired the weapon when there was no danger to himself or his wife. And that videotape is quite important. The footage is grainy, but chilling. It shows Paula coming out of her house and getting into a shouting match with Jennifer. In the background, Neil could be seen peeking five times before firing his shotgun. 
The jury also hears damning statements made by Neil during his interrogation with police. They should give me a, a medal here because we have the, the, the police were going over there all the time, right? Because of this domestic stuff. It actually sounds like he's actually bragging about killing Todd. There's no remorse there at all. And it's going to be used by the prosecution to build their case. Again, to show that, that this was intentional. It pointed to a guy with a plan, you know, that he wanted this guy gone and that he was willing to take it that far. In a surprising move, Neil Zumberg decides to testify in his own defense and tell the jury his side of the story. He reiterated that self-defense claim that he thought that Todd had a gun and was going to go for it and was going to use it to kill Paula. In Neil's mind, he was fearful of Todd Stevens and what Todd Stevens could do to his family. He believed in his heart of hearts that his wife was in danger and pulled the trigger. But as the prosecution points out, there's a glaring problem with Neil's story. Todd didn't have a gun on him. He had a cell phone in a holster or a, a case on his belt. And so if he had reached for anything, it would have been that, which wasn't a danger to anybody. Paula Zumberg, in my view, was never in danger. She never tried to retreat. Todd Stevens had just left the front door of his home. There was no reason to shoot the man. After fewer than three hours of deliberation, the jury returns with its verdict. They found Neil guilty of first-degree murder, and they sentenced him to the mandatory term of life in prison with no chance of parole. Jennifer said after the verdict that she was satisfied that there was justice for Todd, but that it was bittersweet because he's gone. The result may not be a surprise, but Neil's reaction to it is. At a sentencing hearing, Neil actually addressed the court and apologized for his actions. It's the first time he ever seemed to express remorse. He told the court that he hadn't been entirely truthful. That came from a, a place of guilt. I mean, he said essentially that he needs to atone and he needed to take on more of the responsibility and that the victim's family deserved that. I was happy to hear that the verdict came through like it did and, and that, that there was admission on Neil's side. One man's inability to peacefully resolve the conflict with his neighbors had torn two families and an entire community apart. But in the aftermath of the tragedy, the neighborhood along Norwood Drive tries to return to normalcy. The families are no longer in the neighborhood. I think everyone kind of sighed a breath of relief. Like, okay, we've got new families in the neighborhood. People feel safe. The Stevens family probably is still very sad, still reeling, still wondering why it had to end like this. It was shocking, surprising. Um, that that all of these little things would would really build up to a loss of life. It shattered the community. It shattered a lot of communities. A lot of people are upset that this could happen. This long beef over feeding deer in the neighborhood, I mean, it sounds preposterous. It's a good reminder to check yourself and don't take these things too seriously. That's, it's just not worth it. 